Hey, Dr. Christensen here with you. Are you at risk for a salt deficiency? You know, there's been an idea I've been seeing around quite a bit lately in the natural health rounds saying that a low salt diet is dangerous and that it may also cause weight gain, make you feel tired, cause you to absorb too much fat, you know, raise your risk of overall death, all these various things. And here we've got the conventional side saying that salt is bad, we want to lower salt to improve your blood pressure. And the tough thing is that it's, it's so tempting to be contrarian. And I completely get the appeal of that. It's, you know, you want to be able to feel like, hey, I'm bringing something important to the table. I've got a message that you wouldn't hear otherwise, and it differs from the common message that you're hearing. So the pitfall, though, is that that appeal can cause us to look at data in ways that may not be as, as accurate. And the conventional side, the message about salt causing a big reduction in blood pressure, that's, that's a weak statement. And the correlation between salt and blood pressure is not perfect. And a lot of the, uh, a lot of the momentum on the opposite side has come from that, from that just big misperception. So the message we're seeing now is looking at a lot of data showing failures of low salt interventions. And what I would make an important distinction on, a couple, a couple of distinctions is that we've got to look at level of evidence. So if you're talking about evidence that comes from a test tube or from an animal study or from even a marker of illness like blood pressure, that evidence is weaker than evidence that's based upon actual outcome studies. So for example, there have been studies on rats and showing that if, if rats are on high salt diets, they, I'm sorry, there was one, one book I read recently which was arguing that low salt makes you gain weight. And the conclusion, the, the reference from which they based that on was a rat study. And in this rat study, there were rats on differing salt intakes, and those on the highest salt intake actually had some weight loss. And the interpretation was that humans would be at risk for weight gain if they ate too little salt. But to look deeply at this one study as like an example of how this reasoning can go awry, the rat study did not show that the low salt rats gained weight. What they showed was that the high salt rates had nutrient malabsorption. And what did high salt look like in this study? Well, it was 4% of the mass of their diet. So for a human, that's going to be like 17,000 milligrams of salt per day, or about like seven teaspoons, more than seven teaspoons. And at that level, the salt was damaging their intestinal tract and it made it to where they were malabsorbing fat and other nutrients as well. So to take the data that rats on salt poisoning malabsorb nutrients and to imply that that means humans on low salt diets will gain weight, that's not fair. That's not a fair conclusion. Now, the, the line of reasoning would go that if you absorb more nutrients, more, more fat, more calories, your body could make more insulin, trigger more weight gain. That was a thought process. Now, there have been studies, there was actually a human study I found in which salt restriction for a short period of time did seem to worsen insulin resistance. But however, there have been a large number of studies that have shown the exact opposite, that salt restriction improves insulin resistance. So now insulin resistance, that's a marker of illness. It's not a disease. No one walks around and says, I feel so awful, my insulin resistance is, is gotta be at a 10 today. <laughs> you know, There's not a direct tie between that and symptoms, but there is a tie between insulin resistance long-term and then cardiovascular disease, early death. It is important, but we cannot conflate the two. And something that changes insulin resistance in the short term may or may not correlate with changes in death risk or disease risk in the long-term. So we've got to look at studies that look at actual human outcomes. And there have been some, but some have been better quality than others. And a difficulty is that some have looked at reported salt intake. You know, how much salt do you think you ate? And of course, that doesn't mean a whole lot. But the best studies, the largest one to date, actually tracked salt via urinary sodium output, which does strongly correlate with just day-to-day -day sodium intake. And the largest one like that really showed that people that were suggested to go on lower salt diets and then tracked by their urine and did overall follow up with salt reduction, we've seen that it has made a big difference in total mortality and cardiovascular mortality. So whenever 
whenever we see conflicting data, it's almost always data at that first step. And the act of science is a two-step process. First, you've got to form some hypothesis, some ideas. And that's completely valid. You know, it's actually a good thing to do because that's how we start to make progress. We think, hey, it looks like salt might raise blood pressure. That's a bad thing. Let's see if salt reduction lowers blood pressure. So first, you've got a hypothesis. Then you do a test. And if the outcome test verifies the hypothesis, then that's meaningful. But the problem that happens is that so many things that are really at the level of just hypothesis or speculation are taken as data points to base decisions on. Like the study I suggested about on rats, for example, about how rats on mega salt diets malabsorb nutrients, that's, that's not a human outcome study. That didn't see what actually happened to humans in real life conditions. So that might be intriguing. And were that study different, that might have been a good basis to do human studies on. But the first step is then just seeing that. And the second step is doing a study on people and seeing what happened. But so often, researchers, scientists, bloggers, they see interesting things in that first step that fit their agenda. And they take that as if that's something solid to act upon. But that level of data is not solid to act on. That's just preliminary data. And preliminary data, honestly, you can find it to support anything and conflicting stuff and things that we know are just not, not accurate. So to date, one of the better studies that was done tracked over 3,000 adults across ages of 30 to 40, 54 years and tracked them for 10 to 15 years. One of these groups that I mentioned was trained to reduce their sodium intake. The other was not. And the one trained to decrease sodium, their urinary sodium output was 23 to 35% lower, which means they were doing it. <laughs> they were following through on that. And what they saw over that following decade and a half was those on less salt had about a 25 to 30% decrease in cardiovascular death. Now, interesting, they didn't see radical changes in the blood pressure amongst these people. So the blood pressure changed only by a few points. And so often we can look at a marker like that because there's markers and there's outcomes. So blood pressure is a marker that corresponds to cardiovascular death. But sometimes things that help a marker don't help an outcome. And other times things that help an outcome may not show up by the marker. And that was the case in this study. They didn't have radical decreases in blood pressure. So if you based it only on the marker, you could say, well, it didn't work. But when we saw the actual outcome of cardiovascular death, we saw, wow, it did work. So even though there are odd little studies saying that, hey, low salt may cause <laughs> rats to gain weight, or which, you know, I explain that, or salt reduction could cause insulin resistance temporarily in people. So these are animal studies and marker studies, not the same as outcome studies. So what else about high salt intake? Well, other studies have shown that we see risks of cancer being higher with, with greater salt intake. And some benefits of salt reduction are that typically there's less food cravings, less fluid retention, and less cortisol activation. Now this brings up the whole adrenal discussion. There have also been a lot of popular writers talking about adrenal health or adrenal fatigue, saying that you've got to add in more salt to offset that. And in truth, your sodium does push down your aldosterone. And the pituitary tells the adrenals to make both cortisol and aldosterone. So if you consume a lot of salt and you lower aldosterone for a while, that will cause your adrenals to compensate by making more cortisol. That doesn't work for longer than several days, but it does initially. And so if you do have fatigue associated with low cortisol, you can game the system for a few days by taking a ton of salt. But what's happening is you're just tricking that equation. You're just taking in so much salt that you need less mineralocorticoid. So your body redistributes the amount of cortisol relative to aldosterone after a brief period of time. And it's completely possible you do feel better from that in the short term. But if you notice, it probably tends not to last more than, more than several days. And the deeper question is, is your body's cortisol low because you cannot make cortisol? or because your body's choosing not to make cortisol. Now, in almost all cases, it's the latter. But in the cases of actual diseases to where you cannot make cortisol, sometimes you need to do higher amounts of salt because also you cannot make aldosterone. Cortisol regulates glucose, 
but it also regulates electrolytes. Aldosterone is stronger at regulating electrolytes like sodium. And so in the absence of those hormones, you can spill too much salt out. And the other question that comes up, well, what if I'm really physically active? You know, like I live in the Sonoran Desert and I, like yesterday I sweat. Had I weighed myself before and after my ride, I'm sure I would have dropped two, three pounds over the course of my ride. I lost a lot of fluid. And I've, I've experimented with this myself and I've read a lot about this, about athletes and hot weather and how, if you got to load up with salt or not. And this is funny, but the more salt you consume, the more salt you excrete, the more you get rid of. And if you're someone that has a high salt intake and, you, and you're outside for a long time and you're really active, you can actually see chalk show up like on your shirt or on the straps of your backpack. And that's salt you're pouring out. So it's almost like an arms race. The more you're taking in, the more your body dumps it out and the more you need. But if your overall intake is lower, you don't excrete as much salt and you don't need none, but you can do safe at the lower range of the typical daily intake say, you know, 1,600, 2,000 milligrams, you can be fine with that if you're active. In the moment of activity, as you need more fluid, if you're out for more than an hour, you may need more electrolyte, totally true. But in most cases, people that have problems have them because they've overhydrated with water, not because they had too little salt. Now, if you go down on your salt intake, here's the big thing, people say, you know, I love salt, I crave it because food tastes so much better. And this is a very calibrated taste. So in a day or two, your body will get used to a new salt set point and foods will taste fine again, but it will take a couple of days. There is, there is a bit of a shift that way. So is there a risk of eating too little? There is, but for most of us, that's not something we realistically face. Somewhere around 1,600, 2,400 milligrams there's, there's no risks, no dangers from that. And that's been thoroughly studied in large human outcome studies. We can easily consume much more than that. And arguments have shown that if we could take our intake from 3,300, 4,000 or more milligrams per day down to around 2,000, give or more, in America alone, we could see 150,000 fewer deaths per year. And most of our salt now we're taking in is going to be from processed foods and processed foods that's even healthy foods you know even things you get from whole foods or whatever other healthy supermarket those things have salt in them as well and sometimes things that we love like fermented vegetables salsas liquid aminos or whatnot they can have huge amounts of, of salt present uh, the question also comes up a lot about sea salt if sea salt gets a free pass you know, it doesn't get a free pass. The sodium content is the same. Many sea salt advocates talk about how it has so many other good minerals. And true, true but useless. It does have calcium, many other things, but the amount that it has of them are completely irrelevant. It's less than a milligram per day. The one exception, which I think justifies sea salt, is magnesium. So most sea salts are about 3% magnesium. And if you were getting all of your salt from sea salt, that could net you an extra 60, 70 milligrams of magnesium per day. That's useful. Funny thing is that the calcium, the potassium, the iron, the zinc, those are found in sea salt. They're all less than about one to 2% total. So not enough milligrams to really change your amount on those nutrients, but they do change the flavor and some of the cooking properties of salt. So if you see like, Himalayan pink salt, a little higher in zinc, a little more astringent of a taste. And that's true of other variations of salt. It's the difference in those minerals and sometimes even the difference in pollutants that creates the color and the flavor unique things. If you've never tracked your salt intake, I, I love the exercise of food logging and this is one of the good benefits from that. Take, take a week and go on something like MyFitnessPal and just log your diet and just watch your sodium intake. You might be doing great, but when I when I've logged in the past before I thought much about this, I was surprised to see that, you know, healthy, good, unprocessed foods, how easily I could go way, way above a healthy salt target. And even if you don't see changes in your blood pressure in the short term, there still are risks that emerge from that. And even if salt restriction doesn't lower blood pressure, there's still benefits from that. If you're on thyroid medication, simplest rule of thumb is get an iodine-free sea salt and do your cooking at home. 
You know, even, even the pre-made prep foods at supermarkets, try to skip those and start with just basic raw, simple ingredients and use, use your own at home. Dr. Alan Christensen here. Take great care. We'll talk again really soon. Bye-bye.